this is supposed to be a guide. We'll get to the footage and the stops in a second. I'll put some effort into telling you what the plan was, where we stayed, what we took, and how much we spent. Of course it was 2020, so there were some restrictions, and we decided to take a week off on short notice around August, September, to try and salvage some sanity from the year. I say we. The old man retired before everything hit, and bought his dream bike as a retirement gift to himself. Not bad. So what better way to give it a run out? As I said, it was reasonably short notice, so getting accommodation, particularly on the upper west coast, was an absolute nightmare. Places were either staying shut until next season, or they were full because people had the same idea as us taking a trip. Anyway, this is the route that we planned to take, all the way from Glasgow to Inverness, to technically start the NC500. But pretty much doing the whole east coast as part of day one, then staying in Wick. Day two, we travelled over the north coast of the north coast, but booking before going, there was nowhere to stay in the whole west coast, pretty much before Apple Cross. So we travelled inland to stay in Overskeg, which turned out to be an awesome route by itself. Day 3, we travelled down the west coast and over Balakh Naba to stay in Apple Cross. Then, technically, that's the west coast done. And to finish the route properly, you go on from sort of Apple Cross direction back to Inverness where you start. But I'm not sure what was over that way and the thought of doing the Inverness to Glasgow motorway again gave me the fear. We know the sort of Apple Cross Fort William direction back to Glasgow route so well because folk in the central belt often take it on a day trip and it's epic, so we did that instead. So having made that decision, day 4 we had time in hand and took a detour over to Sky for a bit, then came back over and stayed in a nice hotel in Fort William to treat, well, our arses after being 4 days in the saddle. Then the last day was an easy, awesome run back to Glasgow from Fort William. In terms of where we stayed, it was 5 days and 4 nights. Accommodation was 480 for 2 people, and that was staying in a 2 bedroom house on day 1, like an Airbnb that we actually got through booking.com. A sort of traditional hotel out in the middle of nowhere, in separate rooms. A really nice hostel that, honestly I've stayed in poorer hotels, and a really nice hotel for the last night. So 240 per person, which is not bad at all. Fuel is a big one, but this varies hugely on fuel economy and how you ride. The old man's Harley was unsurprisingly poor on fuel, and he would often run really low before the light on my monster had even come on. We took turns paying for fuel, and from Glasgow back to Glasgow, door to door, was 1,016 miles. I roughly worked it out that my monster was over £100 for the trip, and my dad probably being closer to £150. I'll also add a link in the description, which is a Google map for all the fuel stations along the route. Food is almost pointless to talk about because it's so dependent on how you eat, what you eat and so on. We ate like kings most of the time, like a really nice Indian on the first night, and a fillet steak dinner in the nice hotel on the final night. But for example, on the second day we got caught out, had no dinner, nowhere was open, and we had to eat pork pies and yogurts in the local spa. Also, a few of the meals were tied up with where we were staying. We also sampled expensive old single malts every night over the trip too. <laughs> All in I'd say it was about £500 each for the trip and everything included. Again, 5 days, 4 nights and spending way more than needed. Stay in more humble digs, share a more economical vehicle and I don't know, make sandwiches and it'd be a really inexpensive, incredible trip. Equipment wise, this is one of the most important things we had on the trip. I use a quad lock because it's really quick to clip in and out and your phone isn't going anywhere. But anything that can mount your phone for Google Maps makes things infinitely easier. Particularly in the highlands, where signs are less obvious, and it usually works even when reception is poor. Remember to turn the auto rotate off on your phone when using maps, because when you lean it can change to landscape, and it doesn't change back. I also didn't get the phone charging system I bought installed in time, but I kept a charger brick in my pocket and ran the cable from my pocket to my phone, which actually worked fine. I recorded using an old GoPro that didn't have any stabilisation. The newer ones are better because of the stabilisation, and you can take the fisheye effect away, meaning the background doesn't look quite so far away. I can't tell you how little justice the footage does to what we actually experienced. A handy checklist for you and everything that I put into my waterproof backpack. If you want your wet weather bike gear, because it's Scotland and it, it's not guaranteed to rain, but you pick five days, unless it's in the height of summer, chances are you will get rain at some point. Your bike cover, we only used that one night out of the four. Your disc lock, or whatever your security is, for sure. Uh, something that was underrated was a microfiber and a visor wipe. Definitely take that, it comes in really handy at the stops. And two things I didn't have to use, which was a puncture repair kit and 
a pump that I have that is battery powered and it pumps your tyres up. Uh, clothing wise, jeans, a couple of t-shirts, a hoodie, a pair of trainers, your underwear and I took a towel, I didn't need it but just in case it came in handy. Then toiletries, med kit, I took aspirin and I suppose if you've got any medication you want to take that as well. Your charger brick, your cables and remember to take plugs just in case there's no USB option. And take some snacks just in case you get stranded or whatever. I took some beef jerky but thankfully never had to use them. I don't ride with your buds but I got a pair after day two. Takes a bit of relief out of the drone and the wind noise. So back to the trip. We decided to go the popular anti-clockwise way around the trip. It's supposed to be so the views get better and better. Having now done it, I'm not sure that's even fair, but the reason we did it was to get the three hours from Glasgow to Inverness out of the way where we were fresh faced and not gubbed from four or five days riding past all of the good stuff. So yeah, we headed to Inverness for the official start of the NC500, stopping for fuel a few times including a quick look at some small town with lots of history called Dunkeld, which is considered the gateway to the Highlands, and having lunch in Kingusie next to Newtonmore which is also a really nice town through the Cairngorms, just over halfway to Inverness and before Aviemore. Our first sightseeing stop was about half an hour north of Inverness, called Fairy Glen Falls. The walk from the car park to Fairy Glen is long, particularly in bike gear. We parked the bikes just off the road right where the GPS said the falls were and cut through the gap. It's supposed to be really nice though, and you wouldn't be able to park a car where we ditched the bikes. It's a good place to check out and get some lame pictures. I'll say it again, they say the west coast is the most impressive, but to be honest, that's like saying I couldn't get a Ferrari so I had to settle for a Lamborghini. The east coast is absolutely stunning. Then we headed to Dunrobin Castle, which was just over half an hour after Fairy Glen Falls. This was an impressive castle with beautifully maintained gardens around the back that you're free to explore. It was a good place to stop and take a break with that garden right on the water. The archway of trees as you leave are quite cinematic to ride through as well. An hour again after Dunrobin Castle was the Whaley Go Steps in Leibster. This was one of the highlights of the trip. The entrance is easy to miss, as to me it looked like an exit only junction, but there's a small car park and the steps are down and round the other side of the cottage. Make sure you're fit and don't take too much down there though, because particularly coming back up is a mission with all the steps. Once you get down there though, the view is spectacular between all the cliff edges, looking out into the sea, the birds and what's left of the area they use to catch the fish. The history behind the place is amazing, including a local telling us about very elderly women carrying buckets of fish all the way up the steps, which we had to stop halfway walking up, and then walking again all the way to Wick and back just to sell them. Wick is a 10 minute ride from the steps, and that's where we stayed. As I said at the start, it was a really classy two bedroom end terrace with private parking at the back. We got settled in, then ventured out to see where we could get fed. We decided on Spice Tandoori which was brave considering you spend hours the next day getting shaken and thrown around. I got the tandoori and it was unreal with the peshwari and garlic nans. First day, over 9 hours and 300 miles travelled. So, on to day 2, and this was easily the most amount of footage I had to comb through. As I said, there's a lot of talk about the west coast being the most beautiful, and I'm not sure if the weather played a part, but in terms of views, I thought the actual north coast of the north coast was insane. Again, none of this footage does it any justice. I spent half the time looking back, gesturing to my dad saying, Jesus Christ, look at this. We did 160 miles this day, and we weren't disappointed. Only 20 minutes from Wick, and you end up in John O'Groats. This place is awesome and completely worthy of all the talk. There wasn't much to do because a lot of the places were shut due to restrictions, but just seeing the views and getting to go up to the iconic sign and have your picture taken was really cool. We didn't have to ride long before the next stop. Duncan's Head is just 5 minutes from John O'Groats and was, as a view, the most astonishing thing on the whole trip. Of all the things to do in this whole tour, this is an absolute must. You take a fun little scenic route on the run up to it, then you get to a car park with a lighthouse. Standing in the car park looking at the lighthouse, turn 90 degrees to the right 
and walk over the grass and keep walking. There's various things to see on that walk, but the jewel in the crown is at the end where the stacks of Duncan's base sit. Honestly, it was a beautiful day and my jaw was on the floor. Just half an hour west, it's done at head. John O'Groats gets all the glory, but if Duncan's Bay Head shouldn't be missed, then neither should Dunnet Head, which is the true most northerly point in mainland Britain. There's loads to see here also, but the main attraction is the cliffs that are a really short walk down from the car park. I only smoke a cigar on special occasions and chose that moment to have one, it was perfect. Also, never miss an opportunity to get an arms out picture. Less than half an hour from Dunnet Head it's Thurzow. We parked the bikes up and had a look around, and it was a good place for lunch options given it's one of the biggest towns up that way. The plan was then to go to Puffin Cove, which was 20 minutes from Thurzow, and looking online seemed like a great spot to check out. We were sure we rode past it, then we got back to roughly the right area. The place to park wasn't obvious and the sat nav was intermittent, so we eventually gave up and kept going. By the way, if you know where it is, stick it in the comments. So we were back on the road, heading west. This was quite a long stretch, having started in Thurzo and the next main stop being Smoo Cave two hours away, but the views were unbelievable. Not just the coastline, but all the different types of road with mostly really good surfaces, just amazing to ride on, with the odd bit of wildlife or sheep thrown in to remind you that you aren't actually in no man's land. We fueled up both the bikes and ourselves a couple of times on the route. One of those stops was Weaver's Cafe, which was an outdoor seating area with stunning views. Their coffee and cakes are mega, definitely recommend stopping at it. We actually drove past, but someone further down suggested we head back up. The hotel we were staying in did ask days in advance if we wanted dinner, and we said no because of the mileage involved in that day, and we didn't want to commit to a time getting to the hotel just in case. It just meant that we could pick our own time and place to eat when we were ready. Well, turned out there was nowhere to eat at all. All the restaurants from miles around were shut because of the situation until next season. We tried phoning what little options Google said there were, and we were just getting answering machines. So we stopped at the spa and had a feast of what was in the fridges. Less than 20 minutes west from the cafe was Ardniki viewpoint. Ardniki is a sort of mini island connected to the mainland, then look it past it, you see the islet in the middle of the loch. Not a bad place to stretch the legs again. Back on the bikes and another 30 minutes of fun roads and more incredible coastal views saw us arrive at the Smoo Cave. This is an extremely popular spot with tourists, literally 2 minutes from Durness. This cave and the surrounding area is quite something. Much in the same vein as those wheelie go steps, take as little down there as possible. If you're doing the trip by bike, then be sure to secure what you can at your bike before you head down. It's a fair walk both down and back up. You'll get to enjoy looking at a passage to the sea on the way down. Then as you round the corner into the cave, you see how vast it is. Explore in there, head up the other steps and walk around. The views from everywhere here are awesome. After the smooth cave, it's on to Durness. On the way there, you can start to get a flavour of the tropical looking beaches at Sango Sands and the Sango Bay. I say looking because despite how they look, there's nothing tropical about the weather. Durness is the sort of last place on the main route before you start heading down the west coast. From there, you want to head over less than a five minute ride to Balnakil Beach. It's absolutely stunning here, then rounding the corner to the entrance of Durness Golf Club. We thought the visitors getting into the water in their wetsuits were brave until they told us a story of earlier when a local lady in her 60s just dived in in her swimming costume.
After their nest, the views get considerably more something out of Middle Earth, with crazy dark mountains disappearing into clouds as you climb and drop over your own mountains and valleys. We headed southwest down to Laxford Bridge. This is where we turned off the main NC500 route to travel half an hour inland for the hotel we were staying in. The whole route was right next to the water, with lochs starting at one side of you, then the other, with our hotel being right on Loch Shin. The hotel was really nice and traditional, with a great selection of malts to unwind with. So, a 180 degree panoramic of Loch Shin was our first view over our awesome breakfast on the morning of day 3, ready to take on another full day. We retraced our steps to Laxford Bridge from the night before, and back on to the official route. Our first stop, 20 minutes from Laxford Bridge, was the famous curved Kylesku Bridge. A good excuse to get out, stretch the legs and take a couple of pictures. We originally planned to move from there to Achmelvik Bay, but we'd seen a lot of the beautiful beaches already, so we decided to skip it. Which, looking at the map, probably wasn't the right way to do it, purely for the amazing roads. I didn't pay attention to the maps and it took us on a 10 minute ride, which was still amazing in fairness, instead of the coastal road west passing Achmelvik Bay, which would have been an additional hour or 30 miles of amazing scenery. Guess we'll have to go back again and do it right. So anyway, next up was Ardrick Castle, now in ruins. Also, remember to turn your camera off. The ruined castle and the fact it was built by the MacLeods was giving me serious Highlander vibes. The views here are beautiful. It's an easy stop as well, given the car park is right on the route. After our break castle, it's half an hour to Ullapool, which is a nice port to stop at and get something to eat. We just had coffee and cake given the size of breakfast. Then, prepare yourself for 20 minutes out of Ullapool to turn off the A835 and onto the A832. This section takes you into the Westeros area. No, not Westeros, you Game of Thrones dweebs. But I do think that's where Martin got the name. This A832 section you ride before turning off onto the A896 is an hour and a half or 60 miles of riding a coastline that will blow you away or put you to sleep. After that, if you thought you were living in Middle Earth the day before, you go from living in RR Martin's Game of Thrones to basically living in an RR Tolkien book. I don't know if it was the weather and the clouds, but the ride after that coastline to Balaknaba is equally menacing as it is beautiful. Then we come to Balaknaba itself, the steepest ascent of any road climb in the UK, and it's a single track road. Word of advice? Whatever the weather's like at the foot of Balaknaba, it's tenfold when you're up there. If it's raining at the bottom, then you're literally riding into a raining cloud going up there. We did it when there were barely even any cars willing to do it, never mind bikes. The hairpins reminded me of Stelvio or similar ones in mainland Europe. The views are supposed to be stunning, but we couldn't see any of it, but the actual pass itself is incredible. If you don't fancy the pass for whatever reason, there's a coastal road to Applecross that starts just after Shield Egg that takes you northwest, then south, about an hour in total, which is roughly the time it takes from Shield Egg to Applecross anyway, going over Balaknaba. After Balaknaba, we reached our overnight in Applecross, which was a really nice hostel. I've not stayed in many hostels, and we booked it because of how close it was to the pass and the fact that there wasn't much availability, but as I said at the start of the video, I've stayed in much poorer hotels. The hostel was really popular with bikers and good to see so many bikes sitting there when we arrived. Once we were settled we jumped back on the bikes to find food. The weather was mental but because of restrictions there was no room at the Apple Cross Inn inside so we ate our fish pie and chilli outside at the gazebo with the wind blowing a gale. Day 4, gluttons for punishment and feeling bold we went back over Balaknaba in the morning to try and see the views we missed out on, but the weather was just as bad as the day before, if not worse. You couldn't see 20 feet in front of you at some points. 
If I was doing the trip again, I'd probably have taken the coastal road I mentioned on the way to Applecross the day before, then went over Balakna Bar when leaving. That way you get to do both roads, rather than retrace your steps, but we gave it a shot. Once over the other side of Balakna Bar, we started heading east, away from the west coast, where we stopped at DMK Motors in Loch Arran. This is where I met the love of my life. Big shout out to them. Now, this is the point where you're supposed to go back over to Inverness to complete the trip, and I'm sure the roads that way are tremendous, but there was no way we were missing Fort William to Glasgow to round off the trip. So before we left that morning we decided we had loads of time between our start and Applecross to finish in the day in Fort William, so we booked some ferry tickets online. We turned off 5 minutes out of Loch Arran, and the plan was to go over to Skye via the bridge at Kyle of Loch Alsh then catch the ferry at the south of the island from Armadale to Malague, where Malague to Fort William is less than an hour, but more on that in a second. Sky is incredible, there's so much to see and do, and it's one of the most popular places in the country for tourists. Want to know how good it is? We took one road the whole way up and back on a day with poor weather and I still had a ton of footage. We tried to fit something in with what time we had before our ferry, it was all pretty relaxed. We just got a sandwich somewhere for lunch because we'd stopped for coffee and bacon rolls earlier, but with more organisation we could have picked some of the several excellent lunch spots. Having been to Sky several times before we picked somewhere that involved a decent amount of riding roads, so we settled on the Old Man of Star, one of the most popular spots on the island. Were we actually going to take the hour to walk up to the top? No. In the bike gear? That's what we told ourselves. But seriously, by the time we got there the wind was blowing sideways and the bikes were actually moving on the side stands on the hill. I got my phone out to take the picture of the store and then we had an email from the ferry company to say it was cancelled. Eh, uh, what does that mean for time? What was going to be an hour at the other side after the ferry was a two and a half hour round trip instead, back over the bridge and round the long way. We had the time though in the end. Even enough to put the bikes out of their 4 day misery and give them a wash. Plus it was hardly a hardship, because the roads the long way, like everywhere else around there, are immense. You gawk at about 10 different lochs this way, including one called Loch Lochy, which kinda reminded me of Boaty McBoatface. I'd originally booked the hotel because it had the full spa, jacuzzi, steam room thing going on, and after 4 days would have been the ultimate way to chill out. I never thought it through though, as only the pool was open. Nice idea anyway. We make Fort William in plenty of time to book dinner at the hotel, get cleaned up, have a cracking steak dinner and some whiskey and wine as we reminisce about the trip, and looking forward to our easy run back the next day, given it's only a few hours and we know the roads so well. From Sky to Skyfall on the last day, as I say this day was easy and we had plenty of options as to where to go on the way back. We got up, had a swim, then breakfast in the hotel, then we got on the road. We decided to go the long way because we had so much time and we wanted to fit as much as we could into the trip. This made it a great way to finish because there was no pressure and no unknown, just choosing where we were going as we were doing it, all along some of the best roads this country can give you. To think we went all around the north coast of the country, into the highlands, up the east coast from Inverness, across the very top of Scotland, back down the west, travelling over 800 miles up until that point. But look at these ridiculous views and roads only an hour or two away from where we live. Some of the views and roads even right on our doorstep when you want to go a quick ride are beautiful, but this is just staggering. I wish I could remember when it was I first seen these views, but in truth I've been seeing them almost all my life. Since I was in the back seat of my folk's car, me and my wee bro begging the old man to go over the crests too fast so we could feel the weightlessness. Now we've just ridden together across the country, with me leading the way and going over those same crests, but this time feeling the air punching your body, the wind blowing into the visor you've cracked open, the bottom of your helmet holding your jaw from dropping, and the weightlessness. It was pretty cool. So we stopped at the Green Well in Tindrum and decided to head west from there over the A85, then south onto the A819 to get to Inverary. The roads to and from Inverary in any direction are amazing, and that's why it's so popular with bikers. 
There's loads to see here, from a really nice little town with a gift shop, to a castle and even a jail, which is now a museum. I recommend going to the chippy here or getting a coffee and cake somewhere because everything is good. From here we headed to Rest and Be Thankful which is just 20 minutes over from Inverary and one of my favourite views in all of Scotland. Standing at the Rest and Be Thankful viewpoint down over the old military road is unforgettable. Normally going to and from here you stay on the A83 which runs parallel to the old road but just in the last 10 years there have been many, many landslides where fortunes are spent but it never gets properly fixed. Despite this, I've never actually been over here when they've been fixing it until this day. There was a landslide the month previous, forcing the old military road to be a connecting road. It's only one way, so you need to wait and be convoyed over one direction at a time, which meant huge tailbacks in all directions. Given we were on bikes, we were able to filter to the front of the queue on our side, which is the side of the viewpoint. Because we were on the bikes, the foreman allowed us to park up at the front of the queue and walk over to the cordoned off view while we waited for the convoy in the opposite direction. This gave us plenty of time to get off the bikes, go for a walk around the area, get some pictures and chat to the workers. Then once it finished, we jumped back on the bikes and were waved behind the convoy van. The detour through the valley was mega. To get to be at the front, as we moseyed through the old road, able to see virtually unobstructed was special. Given everything we'd just done the days previous, and our choice of this route back, I couldn't think of a more fitting way to finish our tour in the bright sun. Once we got out the other side of the detour, it's less than an hour to home, so there was nothing left to do but blast back, with the Erskine Bridge near home the final landmark on our journey. Thanks for watching and I hope this video was helpful. I'll leave you with the best picture of the trip from Glencoe as we tried to recreate the famous scene from Skyfall on the last day.